Okay, um, Vice Chancellor, Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good evening and welcome. Before I invite Vice Chancellor Professor John Dewar to introduce our distinguished speaker for this year's China Studies Oration, Dr. Jeff Raby, um, I'd like to make a few brief observations about the current state of uh, China-Australia relations, focusing in particular on a few issues that have um, become quite prominent in the media. On the one hand, Australia's relations with China have never, uh, have never been more multifaceted. On the other hand, they have perhaps never been more parlous. In Australia, um, we've seen the introduction of foreign interference laws, the banning of Huawei and ZTE from providing equipment to Australian telcos for their upcoming 5G rollout, stripping uh, Huang Xiangmo of his Australian residency and banning him from returning to Australia for fear of political interference, worries about the covert operations of the United Front Work Department in the Australian community, escalating warnings, particularly on universities, about the risks of research collaboration with Chinese entities, um, innuendo about a certain state actor's role in a couple of high-profile cyber attacks, one on Parliament House and one on ANU. And, of course, ongoing controversy about the role of Confucius Institutes. At the same time, there's concern about China's um, South China Sea build-up, uh, its growing strategic influence in the South Pacific, its ambitious Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the continuing protests in Hong Kong, as well as human rights issues such as the incarceration of huge uh, numbers of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and the continued detention of Chinese Australian writer uh, Yang, Yang Hejun. Some commentators see the challenge in the Australia-China relationship rather narrowly as one of how to balance strategic and economic interests, commercial interests. Others have offered more nuanced, albeit sobering, assessments. Just last Thursday, uh, DFAT Secretary Francis Adamson, a former ambassador to China, um, told Senate estimates, and I quote, some points of difference may come and go and be able to be resolved, but other points of difference, which go more deeply to the difference between our systems and our values, are likely to endure. So it's against this sombre backdrop that our speaker this evening also a former ambassador to China, will address the issue of Australia's diplomatic relations with China, uh, a relationship in which, uh, and I quote, Australia now has no voice in Beijing when it comes to issues such as regional peace and security, our concerns over Hong Kong and human rights. He will explain how things have come to such a pass and what can be done to position ourselves more effectively. So I'd next like to invite um, Vice Chancellor jo Professor John Dewar uh, to, to welcome our speaker. Thank you very much, John. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to introduce Jeff Raby. Now, last year, the inaugural China Studies Oration was given by Kevin Rudd. Um, and there's a connection between last year's orator and this year's in that Jeff was Australia's ambassador to China during Kevin Rudd's first term as Prime Minister, and they know each other well. So it's fitting that Jeff gives the second China Studies oration. If we think about Australia's relationship with China over the last decade or so, there haven't been many more important figures in that relationship than Jeff Raby and Kevin Rudd. So I congratulate John, John Maycomb, on putting together such terrific events. And it says something about the regard in which La Trobe's China Studies Research Centre is held that it's able to attract such prominent speakers to give this oration. The centre is a key element of La Trobe's China strategy. And since its launch in 2016, it's earned a reputation as one of the country's leading centres in promoting China studies. But our relationship, that is La Trobe's relationship with China, is nothing new. In the early 1980s, La Trobe was one of the first Australian universities to admit students from the People's Republic of China. 
In the mid-1990s, we had one of the largest offshore presences of any Australian university in China. And one of our academic partnerships with East China Normal University in Shanghai has been going for more than 30 years, one of the longest standing partnerships between an Australian and Chinese university. And earlier this year, we established a joint research hub with East China Normal, which sits as a program within the China Studies Research Centre. Now, as we know, China is of growing importance, not just, to, not just to universities, but to economies all over the world. The country's rise has had an enormous impact on the globe and particularly our region. And China's transformation has been integral to Australia's longest period of economic growth, and higher education in Australia has been a great beneficiary of that growth. But in becoming the world's second largest economy, China has fundamentally changed global institutions and the structures governing economics, politics and the environment. This means that understanding China and its impact on the world is becoming more and more complex but more and more important, as Jeff will no doubt dis discuss in his talk. We know a little bit about these issues um, from our perspective as a university. We're becoming used to the scrutiny that's often applied to our Confucius Institute and to periodic reporting by programs such as Four Corners of apparent Chinese influence on Australian universities. And recently I've been making regular trips to Canberra for my role on the steering group of the university's foreign interference uh, steering group that Minister for Education Dan Tian established in August and which will report to the minister by the middle of next month. But the issues affecting Australian universities are just a subset of a much wider set of issues affecting Australia. And discourse about these issues has become very polarised indeed. But one, one thing is clear, no matter which sector or industry you belong to, there aren't many bigger challenges to confront than those posed by our relationship with and our simultaneous proximity to China. To understand the situation and how we might respond, it's essential that we take counsel from those who understand China the best, those who understand its history and the nuances of our relationship with that country, those who understand the special nature of diplomacy in China and the special challenges it poses. No one is better versed in these matters than Jeff Raby. And I'm absolutely delighted to introduce him tonight, particularly because he's had such a close and enduring relationship with his alma mater, La Trobe University. Jeff is a member of La Trobe Asia's advisory board, and he holds not one but three degrees from La Trobe, including a PhD. Before joining the Commonwealth Public Service and embarking on a diplomatic career, he was also a senior tutor in economics at La Trobe University. Of course, he went on to be Australia's ambassador to China from 2007 to 2011. And he's also served as Australia's ambassador to the World Trade Organization and to APEC. In total, he spent 27 years in the Australian public service, mostly with DFAT. He now runs his own strategic advisory consultancy based in Beijing. La Trobe has not produced a more celebrated alumni and in 2007, we awarded Jeff with a La Trobe University Distinguished Alumni Award. And earlier this year, he was also made an Officer of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to Australia-China Relations through senior diplomatic roles and to multilateral trade policy development. He's also a very generous man. Just earlier this afternoon, Jeff made the largest single cultural gift that has ever been made to La Trobe University. We are absolutely thrilled to accept Jeff's generous gift of the Jeff Raby Collection of Chinese Art. This comprises 174 objects collect collected over the last 30 years, including paintings, photography, work on paper, ceramics, sculpture, and textiles. Valued at more than $2 million, we will absolutely cherish this culturally and artistically significant collection. It will be a valuable resource for research and teaching in disciplines such as cultural studies, social history, 
and Asian Studies. And it will cement our very special relationship with Jeff Raby and will create a legacy that students, staff and visitors can enjoy for many years to come. Jeff, thank you from all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Raby Ao to deliver the 2019 La Trobe University China Studies Oration. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Of course, I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, distinguished academic staff, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to give this oration. Um, John picked up that uh, the uh, original oration, the first one, was given by my colleague um, uh, Kevin Rudd, or former colleague Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister. And uh, uh, I think it's very appropriate that I follow him. It seems like throughout my entire career, I followed Kevin. <laughs> Uh, I followed him to Beijing when he went to Beijing. It was some time after that that I followed him there. We overlapped for six months. Um, I just note, thank you kindly uh, referring to the uh, award in June. Um, I noted that in that Queen's Birthday Honours list, uh, Kevin, of course, got an AC and mine was just an AO. <laughs> but that's how it is with Kevin. And I'm reminded of a... Um, uh, episode in the Australian Embassy back in 2008, April 2008, when Kevin made his first visit as Prime Minister to China. And you have to remember, it was a remarkable thing to have a fluent Mandarin speaker elected as a Prime Minister of a major country, uh, especially if you like an Anglo-Saxon country like Australia. And Kevin was something of a rock star in China. And so with my interest in Chinese contemporary art, and particularly the artists who had built their careers in Australia after Bob Hawke had very generously uh, allowed Chinese students who were in Australia in the late 80s, early 90s to have easy access to permanent residency. I featured a special exhibition for Kevin in his honour at the Embassy of these Chinese Australian artists. And it was remarkable. There were hundreds of people. It was a huge event. One of the artists here tonight, Tang Yifeng, was, uh, who's in the, in the collection, was there uh, on that evening. And Kevin began by thanking me as ambassador for putting the event on and all of that. And he went into his remarks and spoke about the time Kevin and I were together in the embassy in Beijing, reflecting on what, what life was like in 1986. And then he paused and hesitated and stopped, thought for a while and he said, but of course, my career has gone much better than the ambassador's, <laughs> which the Australians in the audience thought were hilarious, but the Chinese didn't know whether to laugh, hide their heads in shame or whatever. Uh, Kevin hadn't quite worked out the cultural nuances even by then. <laughs> in those days though, back in 2008, relations with China were very different than they are today. We enjoyed almost unrivaled access to the top Chinese leadership. High-level visits were frequent and engagement was expanding exponentially on every front. Today, the Australia-China relationship is, as I say in the title of my presentation today, at its lowest point since diplomatic relations began 46 years ago. This is something the Australian government doesn't wish to discuss. Its diplomats are paid to put a positive spin on things. Elements of the conservative populist media almost rejoice in this state of affairs. These days, all official contact has been frozen. China is doing what it usually does to show its official displeasure, close off official contact. An Australian Prime Minister has not been in China since 2016 when Malcolm Turnbull uh, attended APEC, which is a multilateral uh, meeting, and Premier Li Keqiang visited Australia early in 2017 for a bilateral meeting, but no bilateral head of government visits have taken place in either direction since. The drawbridge has been raised and we stare at each other across a moat that is inexorably widening. This is the longest gap between high-level visits for decades. When Bob Hawke embraced China's vision of reform and engagement in the international system and understood what it would mean for Australia, um, both sides had endeavoured from then on to maintain annual high-level exchanges. Now, bilateral trade is at present running at record levels. But ever since uh, diplomatic relations were established in 73, regular official contact has been maintained over all of these years. Never before has Australia been denied access to the highest levels of the Chinese political system as it has been over the past two years. It is in this sense that I say that relations are at their lowest ebb. 
Prime Minister Morrison's recent meeting in Jakarta with President Wang Shishan on the sidelines of the inauguration of, President, of the Indonesian President does not mark a thaw. Wang Shishan is only number four in the protocol order. More importantly, he is not a member of China's key ruling group, the all-powerful seven-member standing committee of the Central Committee. It says much about the relationship that after so many years of no senior level contact, this was the best that Australia could achieve for a recently elected Prime Minister. For the obsessively protocol conscious Chinese government, it was just short of giving Australia a diplomatic rhubarb. How we got into the state of affairs, what it means and what we might do about it are the subjects of this evening's oration. The China threat. Over the past 46 years of diplomatic relations, Australia and China have been through a number of difficult times, but none so as emphatic as we are experiencing today. On the Australian side, officials rightly say that China has increasingly engaged in bad behaviour, notably in the South China Sea, in cyber attacks, in attempting political interference in domestic politics, and monitoring and attempting to influence student behaviour on our campuses. These are the main grievances cited, but there are others. Purported theft of technology, unfair and unreciprocal investment rules, the breaches of WTO subsidy agreements, to mention just a few. Many of these grievances are not new. Ten years ago, for instance, China resumed assertive, muscular and on occasions aggressive tactics in the South China Sea. Certainly China pushed harder than ever before and had a ruling against it by the International Dispute Settlement Court which had flouted. From an international perspective, its behaviour was bad no matter what it believed to be the merits of its own case, something by the way which democratic Taiwan supports. Beijing has all too often adopted bullying behaviour in its foreign relations, be it in trying to interrupt the lucrative tourist trade with Taiwan to express displeasure over the outcome of the last presidential election, curtailing travel and trade with South Korea over the deployment of the TAD missile, uh, anti-missile defence system, seizing Philippine fishing vessels in the Parcel Reef, or much further back, discouraging Japanese auto sales into China uh, over the Diayu Senkaku Islands dispute. Recently, Australia has been left to ponder the meaning of unexplained interruptions to trade in coal and wine resulting from new inspection regimes and a reportedly appreciable fall in student enrolments for next year. Last year in the AFR, I wrote uh, that China needed to adopt a more confident and mature foreign policy commensurate with its weight and standing in the world. The Chinese government's hypersensitivity to criticism was out of place for a country that exercises great influence owing to its economic strength and the investment it makes in diplomacy. A major challenge for China then is that with its ever increasing presence and influence in world affairs, it must behave more like a leader rather than a victim. On the Australian side, the discrete elements that have led to the current situation are easy to identify. Friction rose substantially over Australia's strident criticism of China over the South China Sea, especially in the wake of the Hague decision. It, was that, it wasn't that Australia was critical, indeed many others were also critical. <coughs> but we were extreme in our public statements and we became an outlier. This was compounded when, in the middle of the furore, then Foreign Minister Julie Bishop made a poorly judged speech in Singapore saying that China was not fit for regional leadership because it was not a democracy. Domestically within Australia, the China threat syndrome gained momentum with, the sense, with some sensational TV reports of spies and agents of influence. That there was fire where there was smoke in the form of the Dastiari affair encouraged something of a political feeding frenzy. In the midst of this, and with anti-Chinese fear being whipped up by the shock jocks, Prime Minister Turnbull made his disastrous statement um, in reasonable Chinese, I might add, during the Benelong election that the Australian people had stood up to China by introducing anti-foreign interference laws. Um, now such laws were perfectly reasonable and long overdue. 
China could have no objection to them and did not. But when, China, Ch but when Turnbull paraphrased the statement made by the founding, made at the founding of the PRC by Chairman Mao, which referred to standing up to over 100 years of foreign occupation, depredations, oppression, and war, Turnbull at once made the foreign anti-interference laws solely about China, and in some of the most insulting terms possible. Now, it was not intended to be like this, and Turnbull did not mean to offend. He probably thought no one would understand he's Chinese. <laughs> but Beijing is brittle, and face means much to Chinese people, whether communist or not. This was soon compounded by the grand statement made in the Australian Parliament by Mr Morrison when, as Minister for Home Affairs, he said that Huawei would be blocked from participating in any aspect of Australia's 5G network. It was a blanket ban like no other from any government up to that point in time, and like no other since except possibly the US. Um, but from one day to the next, it's very difficult to know what the US policy is under President Trump. Other members of the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Group are fudging for sure under pressure from both US and China, but none seems to believe that a blanket ban is required. Certainly the British and the Germans do not see the need, believing that sensitive aspects of the network can be protected. Similarly, and under pressure from the US, Australia has not signed up to any of the Belt and Road Memoranda of Understanding. Some 152 countries, including 18 from Europe, have signed relevant memoranda to participate in the Belt and Road Initiative. A number of international bodies, including UN agencies, also participate now. Joining the BRI is costless in terms of taking on any new obligations or surrendering any aspect of Australia's sovereignty. At most, our signing the non-binding MOUs adds legitimacy to the BRI, but this has already been achieved in any case, whether or not Australia were to sign up. Whatever the commercial benefits of the BRI may or may not be, it is curious to say the least that we would choose to stand outside an emerging international body that will impact on Australia's interests and not seek ourselves to participate and influence the course of its development. The Victorian government should be congratulated on having the clear-eyed vision to recognise that the BRI poses no threat to Australia's national interest, while not participating denies people of Victoria the opportunities that may follow signing the MOUs. The Canberra Security, Intelligence and Defence Establishment's view that the BRI is an attempt to impose a Sinocentric order on the world is not widely shared outside of Canberra or many other places other than Washington. The more such a view is at odds with reality, the more likely it will be that other state governments in Australia will follow Victoria's lead. The international order has now changed, not only because of China's rise and the US's stepping back from leadership of a unipolar global liberal international order, but because China has been willing and able to build new coalitions and international arrangements in collaboration with many other countries to start to refashion the US-led post-Second World War institutional arrangements. These developments were inevitable, not just because of China's economic ascendancy, but because of the overall shift in the weight of the world's economic activity from the Atlantic to East Asia and the Indian Ocean. Australia's response to these profound changes in the international order has been largely one of denial. Hoping to keep our vital commercial interests with China growing while hewing ever more closely to the United States. It is something that Canberra does not like to hear said, but from a realist foreign policy perspective, the relationship between Australia and China is asymmetrical. Australia needs China more than China needs Australia. This is not to say Australia should be supine in its dealings with China or that it should step back from asserting its values and concerns, especially over issues such as borders and human rights. Rather, it means that Australia needs to be much more skillful in how it handles the relationship, relying much more on diplomacy and coalitions and defining for itself a more independent foreign policy. In what remains in the rest of this oration, uh, I'll state four propositions and then make 
some policy suggestions with which to wrap things up. The propositions are, firstly, Australia's China policy is a mess as it is unable to decide if China is a friend or a foe. Secondly, Australia is all at sea in the new global order. Thirdly, Australian foreign policy has been weaponized. And finally, the China threat lacks context and proportionality. The Australia's China policy is a mess because it's based on a fundamental contradiction. Sensibly, both Prime Ministers Turnbull and Morrison have felt it necessary to state clearly that Australia does not see China as a strategic competitor, but rather as a strategic partner and one with which Australia seeks to cooperate. In view of the huge economic dependency Australia has on China and the fact that we have no border issues or any historical grievances on either side, how could it be otherwise? The United States, however, has been very clear in the past couple of years, especially as set out in Vice President Pence's speech at the Hudson Institute last October and again this month at the Woodrow Wilson Institute, that the United States views China as a strategic competitor and as a strategic threat. This is also not surprising. The US is the dominant power and China is the ascendant rising power. The US has and will continue to cede strategic space to China. It must if military conflict is to be avoided and clearly neither the US nor China believe that they could prevail in such an event. So the US-China conflict will continue to be played out at an intensity short of military engagement but nonetheless it will, as we are starting to see, be, dis be disruptive and continue to be more disruptive. Moreover, the US will increasingly, increasingly look to its allies like Australia to participate on its side, even when the reliability of the US itself legitimately is being discussed. Consequently, at the same time Australia declares that China is neither a strategic competitor nor threat, we behave as if it were both. This could be seen in everything from our strident position on the South China Sea, our blanket ban on Huawei's participation in 5G, our refusal to countenance participation in Belt and Road, our competition with China for influence in the South Pacific, and our feverish domestic discussion of Chinese interference in everything from politics to university campuses and laboratories. <coughs> Whether the arch-realist John Mearmeiser was correct or not when he said the post-Cold War liberal global order was bound to fail, it is definitely over now. In response, Australia has hewed ever closer to the US. As Alan Gingell argued in his aptly titled book, Fear of Abandonment, Australia has always had the security and indeed luxury of a world order that has been led by a dominant power with whom we shared values, political system and general outlook. Over the past decade, with the palpable rise of China, this has led in Australia to lazy foreign policy. With China's becoming a power capable of challenging the US on many fronts while remaining a one-party authoritarian state, Washington DC and across both aisles of the House seems now to be gripped by a type of buyer's regret. The dominant view is that the US engaged China for the past 40 years on the implicit promise that as its economy grew, markets expanded and it became more deeply integrated in the international system, its domestic politics would become more liberal and pluralistic. In other words, China would become more like us, the US that is. Former CIA intelligence analyst and now academic Michael Pillsbury argues in a recent book that all along China has set out to dupe the West, uh, read the US. Accordingly, according to Pillsbury, China has embarked on a secret 100-year marathon to replace the US as a single dominant world power. Pillsbury argues that the Chinese Communist leadership are pursuing a strategy of warfare first set out by Sun Tzu two, two and a half thousand years ago in the art of war. Pillsbury argues that China is adopting Sun Tzu's tactics of co-opting and beguiling an enemy rather than entering direct conflict. Pillsbury is said to be President Trump's most important advisor on China. Trump has said of Pillsbury that he's the most knowledgeable person in the US on China, 
Uh, Obama used to say Kevin Rudd was, by the way. But uh, <laughs> For those of us in Australia who have been engaged with China during the past 35 years of its reform and open door policies, we feel anything but buyer's regret. In Australia, few supported engagement with China on the ideologically premised assumption that somehow China's political system would evolve into a more competitive pluralist one. While we may have hoped China would become less oppressive and over time respect for human rights would grow, none really imagine that under economic growth, rising prosperity and its entry into the World Trade Organization, China would become democratic in the way that Taiwan and South Korea had, but note that Singapore had not. Australia and many other Western countries supported engagement with China in our own well-defined self-interest. In addition to the obvious potentially enormous economic benefits for a country like Australia, with such pronounced complementarities, Australia's security could only benefit from a stable and increasingly prosperous China. Try to imagine what a breakdown of China would mean for regional, regional stability and illegal immigration. That was a real possibility, in fact, at the end of the self-destructive culture revolution, at the time when Deng Xiaoping began to implement China's market-based reforms and open-door policies. So, at least for me, it's something of an irony to hear last week the Minister for Stopping the Boats say that he has nothing against Chinese people. It's just the Communist Party that runs China that he does not like. Whether China's past half-century of peace, development, stability would have been or could have been achieved under any other form of political and social organisation is a historical counterfactual that could be discussed forever in the Trobe's tutorial classes. <laughs> but the historical record of what, the, but the historical record is what it is, whether we like the Chinese Communist Party or not. With statements like this from a senior minister, it's clear that Australia is being increasingly drawn into the US ideological conflict with China. Through the government's actions, Australia is being taken far from its stated position that China is not a threat. For Beijing, actions will matter more than words. In 2013, Hugh White, in his prescient book, China Choice, set the commentators at each other's throats over how the US should respond to the rise of China. He argued that the US will someday need to choose between confronting China and trying to contain it or to find a way to accommodate China's rise, which will mean sharing global and particularly regional leadership and eventually living with the fact that China will become the regional hegemon. Sensibly, White, as a realist, argued that China's rise could not and would not be contained. And so the preferable course for the US would be to adopt a strategy of accommodating China in advance of conflict. White had audaciously suggested diplomacy was a preferred strategy to war. For that, he was traduced by the conservative commentators in Australia who shamefully accused him of appeasement or worse. In many ways, this set the tone for the subsequent debate and policy development in Australia. Conservative commentators in bodies such as the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPE, which is funded by the Australian Department of Defence and the US military industrial complex, would never countenance China's becoming a regional hegemon. <coughs> so Australia's foreign policy has been weaponized with the security, intelligence, defense establishment taking charge of foreign policy towards China and indeed more general geopolitical policy. They frame Australia's response to the end of the old order and see our security entirely aligned with the US on everything from Chinese inward investment to technology, cyber, students, research and ideology. China is viewed as trying to extend its reach and influence in every sphere to the detriment of Australia's security, values and institutions. The central aim of which is to peel Australia off from the US alliance. As a result, in Canberra, thinking about China policy has become much more confrontational in recent years. Business concerns about the poor state of the bilateral relationship are dismissed as self-interested without regard to the national interest. Academics, well-meaning, but dangerously naive, and commentators such as myself, panda-huggers. That the relationship is so poor 
is seen by some as a badge of honour. Little support exists for doing, substant for doing anything substantive to improve the relationship. The prevalent view is that this is just how things are going to remain and there is no need to do anything to change the current situation. The China threat, after all, after all is everywhere. Internationally, China is seen as a disruptor to the rules-based order and a potential aggressor. Domestically, it is seeking to influence our political processes and undermine Australia's institutions. Both dimensions of the threat, domestic and external, are used to reinforce each other. The domestic dimension is used to feed the narrative that China must be pushed back in foreign policy and bad behaviour by China internationally is used to support the need for greater vigilance domestically. The China threat narrative in Australia is, however, entirely lacking in context and proportionality. For purposes that serve the interests of the proponents of the China threat, threat, fear of the other is prevalent. Evil Fu Manchu is abroad again. Last week, the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs made the front pages with dire warnings of an imminent, I quote, cyber Pearl Harbor. No evidence for such a wild assertion was provided. It was simply enough for the departmental secretary to say it, to put it on the front pages. One set of estimates was a forum for politicians to grandstand, but now senior bureaucrats have taken over that role from their political masters. It was, as is so often the case, a bid for more resources and enhanced powers. The means were at hand to protect us from such a catastrophic event if only politicians would provide both. The Pearl Harbor analogy was itself revealing. Attack must come from the east. No doubt that it would be from China, but in the absence of any evidence, this of course had to be left unsaid. Cleverly, this assertion sought to be reinforced by the publicity surrounding the hacking of the ANU's computers involving a big breach of personal records. Media commentary without evidence claimed it was from China. But the, US, uh, but the university and the government have remained silent. It may have been China, and yet it may not have been. We don't know. But it is reasonable in the current atmosphere to think that had it been China, some evidence by now would have been provided. It may also be the case that whomever the perpetrator, the ANU's own cyber defences were found wanting, and the ANU doesn't wish to talk much more about it. In recent years, ASIO has discovered a nice little earner for itself, attracting funds in a bureaucratic tussle for additional resources. ASIO now has a business and government liaison unit dedicated to alerting, or alarming, business around a range of real or assumed security threats, purported mainly coming from China. Some six years ago, ASIO began itself approaching businesses to warn of potential actual threats from foreign interests. Companies that I've been involved with, for example, were warned not to take mobile phones or laptops when travelling into China. In the case of public, publicly listed companies, however, almost all the information that ASIO advised might be stolen uh, was already available on the public record as part of the continuous disclosure obligations under ASX listing rules. These are all matters that are appropriately handled by companies' risk management committees and treated on a case-by-case -case basis in the normal course of a company's business. When ASIO's annual report was released last week, the outgoing head of ASIO was reported as saying that threats were increasing so much, especially foreign interference, now synonymous, of course, with China, and demand from business for advice that ASIO needs still more resources to do its job. A search of the media could not find any suggestion that this may have been somewhat self-serving. Instead, media reported that this was more evidence of the China threat. Another area where ASIO has been active is in inward Chinese investment. A number of uh, senior executives and chairs of boards have told me of unsolicited visits by ASIO to warn that potential M&A activity posed risks to national security because of Chinese involvement and therefore would not gain FERB approval, Foreign Investment Rev Review Board approval. Accordingly, it would be better not to go ahead than be rejected by the FERB. 
We do not know how much potential investment into Australia has been deterred by this. It would appear that ASIO has become something of a self-appointed gatekeeper on foreign investment to Australia. None of this would matter very much if the process was transparent, open and contestable. But it's not. The latest ASIO report makes much of the need to protect Australia's intellectual property. In reality, much of Australia's intellectual property is already owned by foreigners, be it US, European, Japanese or Chinese parent companies. The image that's created of Australia's vulnerable innovators and scientists being naively fleeced of their intellectual property is largely fiction. Most universities and other research, lab research laboratories have long had protocols to protect that which needs to be protected. Moreover, Australia's capacity to develop technology and innovate relies heavily on collaboration with foreigners. Given that China's investment in R&D matches that of the US, and in some disciplines now surpasses it in terms of articles published in scholarly journals, it is inevitable for the good of Australia's research effort that a high level of co cooperation occurs between Australian and Chinese experts. According to Stephanie Fay, the CEO of Austrade, China is now Australia's number one research partner, while, China, well, while Australia is China's number six, which seems remarkably high given um, our relative size and the size of others, uh, other countries. Uh, a high mutual dependence now exists between Australia and China in research. Collaboration between Australian and Chinese researchers is both inevitable and, in view of China's increasing global leadership in many areas, is of overwhelming port, uh, importance for Australia's <coughs> national interests. The recent ABC Four Corners program on alleged Chinese techno technology and intellectual property theft from Australian universities was a classic of the genre the ABC has been developing. It is shot in the style of an Orson Welles movie with shadows, sharp angles and close-ups to increase the sinister effect. Four Corners has become Orson Wellesian when doing stories on the China threat. Interviewee after interviewee piled on unsubstantiation assertions, implying the University of Queensland had been naive about the Chinese threat. As such, UQ had been complicit in allowing technologies that could be used against Australia to be spirited away to China. The message was that this was all orchestrated in, by Beijing in the interests of the Communist Party. While the Vice-Chancellor was given time to rebut allegations, the time available to him was far outweighed by those asserting dark deeds by China, many without any obvious technical expertise in the matter. The irony of the programs having singled out QU uh, uh, for um, special attention is that its Chancellor, my former colleague and friend Peter Varghese, is a former Director General of the Office of National Assessments and former Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. If anyone in Australia would be aware of and alert to the China threat, surely it would be Peter. Hilariously, it was even suggested that Australia should not work collaboratively, collaboratively with China on genetic research because Australia may become complicit in human rights abuses if such technology could assist in identifying Uyghur minorities from the Han majority. It seems highly doubtful to me that China requires any assistance from Australian scientists in identifying Uyghurs whose human rights it seems intent on abusing. A university in Western Australia is collaborating with a Chinese counterpart in producing a new super variety of barley using genetic material that can only be derived from Tibet. Should this work not proceed because of the human rights situation in Tibet? No doubt there are risks, and Australia has vulnerabilities that need to be understood and addressed, and addressed as best as they can. These should be put into context by people that know what they are talking about, and the response needs to be proportional to the risks posed. Where there may have been some insouciance on behalf of university administrators, the intense public discussion has raised awareness of political risks. Australian universities have taken steps to ensure the nature of collaboration with Chinese institutions and researchers is understood, but in view of the enormous potential benefits to be had for the universities and Australia more generally, have not allowed themselves to be panicked into overreacting. Despite over two years of intense media discussion around Chinese interference 
the actual number of individuals who have been outed should cause embarrassments should cause embarrassment to the proponents of the China threat. Only two individuals have faced any consequences. The businessman, Huang Xiangmo, and former S Senator Sam Dastyari. If anything, their cases highlight the strength and resilience of Australia's institutions to protect Australia's interests and values, namely the media, parliament, and in the case of Huang, latterly it seems, the ATO. The entire Dastyari affair does not reveal an Australia vulnerable and under threat from dark forces of the United Front Work Department of the Communist Party. To the contrary, it highlights the strength and resilience of Australia's institutions. The United Front Work Department of the Communist Party has become another little cottage industry of the Australia-China threat. Some commentators breathlessly write about it as if it were a new discovery. It has been a publicly known institution in China for decades. Indeed, some 10 years ago as ambassador, I made a, an official call on its deputy, deputy head in Beijing to chat about how things are going. Western intelligence agencies would have known all about the United Front Work Department and would have been monitoring the activities of its staff and associates, and associates for years, uh, long before some of the, um, the, the recent media uh, reporting. Recently, Gladys Liu, the newly elected Liberal member for the Outer Suburban House of Representatives seat Chisholm has come under intense public scrutiny for her past associations with overseas Chinese groups with apparent connections to the United Front Work Department. She certainly mishandled the situation initially by denying the links. She would have been better demanding evidence of where these links had compromised her loyalty to Australia. Here again we see the absence of context and proportionality. It is a fact of life China is run by the Communist Party. Similarly, that the party has bodies such as the United Front Work Department to operate overseas to blunt overseas criticism of the party and China more generally. Many other states similarly try to influence foreign opinion in favourable directions. It is also a fact of life that overseas Chinese have a strong sense of cultural identity and many, uh, not all, gravitate to overseas Chinese associations and business groupings for mutual support in a foreign land. Many such groups will have contacts with the United Front Work Department and Chinese diplomatic missions. Not all Chinese members of such groups are well disposed to the Chinese Communist Party. Similarly, Chinese business people within and outside China give <coughs> gifts to business associates. It's just how business is done in a Chinese cultural setting. In China, business people also crave recognition and legitimacy and commercial favours from association with politicians and government officials. Much of this association is really just about face or prestige, above and beyond financial standing. Business people really do like to line their office mantle pieces with photos of officials, particularly foreign officials. Even ambassadors are prized uh, photos. <laughs> Business culture in China is markedly different than in Australia. This needs to be recognised as an uncomfortable truth along with the influence of the United Front Department and links between it and legitimate overseas Chinese organisations. This is the context and Australia has well developed laws to deal with corruption as do individual companies with internal rules on accepting and giving gifts. The regulatory framework has been strengthened through, through the foreign anti-interference laws and these should have been introduced a long time ago. Recognising all the challenges in the scheme of things and in view of the media and commentariat's obsession with China, with the China threat, the incidents of actual uh, Chinese state-sponsored activity that they have discovered and credibly documented would seem to be relatively minor. But when put against the strength of Australia's institutions, as we have seen time and again in periods of public anxiety about external threats, we can safely sleep well at night. As the Howard government said in the post 9-11 period when it was gearing up against real and potentially dangerous threats from fundamentalists, we need to be alert, not alarmed. So turning to some policy responses, context and proportionality are important in getting the policy responses right. Context is important so problems are not exaggerated domestically. 
In foreign policy, it is also important to understand the historical reasons for disputes. The South China Sea is a case in point. China is just one of five claimant states and was not the only claimant state that sought to build structures on the reefs, reefs and atolls. Both China and democratic Taiwan, by the way, have the same claims over the original nine or 11 dash lines, which has been taken from Japan, which was taken from Japan by the United States and given to the KMT when they were briefly recognized as the post-war government of China. Far from intending to deny freedom of passage, China is concerned to keep these vital sea lanes open. Moreover, the military value of the construction is at least debatable. None of these contextual points were made at the time we were lecturing China over the South China Sea. Australia's position lacked nuance. The South China Sea is not a Machian struggle between good and evil, as it is often presented in the media and by the Australian government. It is instead an immensely complex historical problem that requires subtlety and diplomacy to navigate. The Dastyari affair was a gift for the China threat folk. Its participants were directly from central casting and could link corrupt, uh, corrupt payments to local politicians by a wealthy Chinese businessman who was linked to the United Front Work Department in order to make comment on foreign policy favorable to China. But how many others have been outed? One Chinese agent of, of influence in nearly two years of campaigning doesn't look much like a threat to Australia's democratic institutions or foreign policy. On campuses, it needs to be acknowledged that amongst overseas Chinese students, many are nationalistic, some fervently so, and many are not. Chinese students have protested in favor of the demonstrating Hong Kong, Hong Kong people, and others have protested against them. A range of views can be found among Chinese students for and against the Chinese Communist Party. The various Chinese consulates in the United Front would therefore, to me, seem not to be particularly effective in controlling what students are willing to say and how they behave and think. Universities are acutely aware of academic freedom. The public debates over the role and activities of the Confucius Institutes attests to this. Similarly, with research, while some risks exist, and these should be manageable within existing rules, the benefits to Australian research and cooperation with Chinese scholars and the cost of diminished cooperation should be part of the public discussion for some proportionality to be understood. Importantly, it also needs to be recognised that Australia is not alone. All of Australia's neighbours, now this will come as a great surprise to everyone, I am sure, all of Australian neighbours are facing the same set of challenges. For all, China is the biggest trading partner and most look to the US for their security. All seem to be handling the rise of China and finding their feet within the new international order better than Australia seems to be doing. Australia, Australia alone has its official relations with China frozen. Australia alone is having a highly divisive campaign of fear over the China threat. Australia could well learn from its neighbours in how to manage these epochal changes. Australia needs to move away from weaponising its China foreign policy. So uh, Australia now approaches China on the basis of mutual suspicion and mistrust. Consequently, Australian foreign policy with respect to China is deeply flawed. On one hand, we declare China to be a country uh, with whom we seek friendly relations and strategic cooperation, while we act if, as if China is a strategic competitor. At least the US has openly declared China to be a threat and must be contested at every level. Australia should resolve the contradiction that lies at the heart of its foreign policy. In short, Australian foreign policy needs to return to diplomacy. To the extent China threatens our security and that of our neighbours, we then should be actively building coalitions that will increase the costs to China from bad behaviour. Coalition building was a singular feature of Australian diplomacy in the 80s and 90s, but we have largely vacated the field. Our credibility in any event is seriously tarnished as we have not been able to manage our bilateral relations with China. Together with regional neighbours, we should be looking at how to engage with China constructively on matters of common interest, uh, such as uh, uh, responses to asymmetrical security threats, the environment, pandemics, drugs and people smuggling. 
The challenge for Australia is how to protect and advance our interests in the region which is increasingly dominated by China economically and where its economic ascendancy also finds an increasing military expression, as is of course normal for a rising power. Above all, our policy needs to be based on a realistic assessment of what China will be capable of doing as far as projecting its power. China is a constrained superpower. It is constrained, it's constrained by its history as it's still an empire with unresolved territorial issues inside its borders. It's constrained by its long land borders, uh, 14 uh, countries on its border, 22,000 miles of land border to defend, and uh, much of it has been hostile at different times. And above all, um, it is constrained by its reliance on international markets to supply everything it needs in terms of raw materials and energy to continue to grow and prosper and thus to maintain domestic political stability. So you'll be glad I've coming to my conclusion and thank you for bearing with me. But to conclude, um, the China threat is much exaggerated, both as a military adversary and as a challenge to Australia's domestic institutions. Australia is struggling to find its feet in the new order as it is unprepared for a world in which it cannot lazily rely on the dominant power to share our values, that shares our values and institutions. A foreign policy that has Australia hewing ever closer to the US requires Australia to have a domestic China threat to justify such a policy. Unless China is seen as an internal enemy to Australia, it would be difficult politically to explain while we are in conflict with our biggest trading partner and the dominant regional power. While Australia must be hard-headed about the risks and challenges in our relations with China, arguably, and until recently, we had been doing pretty well at managing these as China emerged as a major power. To the extent China presents risks that we would wish to balance, Australia should return to active regional diplomacy of coalition building, which would include engaging China across a range of issues of, of common interests. This will, of course, not happen until there's a return to more diplomacy in managing our relations with China. And in the current climate, regrettably, that is a vain hope. The great noble enterprise of diplomacy is the avoidance of war. When statesmen forget that, we do indeed live in dangerous times. Thank you. We've got perhaps 20 minutes or 25 minutes for questions, and I believe there's a couple of roving mics. I'm Melissa Conley Tyler, Director of Diplomacy at AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne. Um, I love your call for investing in diplomacy as our way of trying to influence the world. Um, I'm concerned about the long-term underfunding of Australia's diplomatic capacity and how that makes it difficult for us to do anything in the world. I'd be interested in your view. I, I think that's a perennial, and uh, whilst I'm here, I actually want to acknowledge my old colleague, Colin Hesseltine, not old, but um, uh, um, a long-standing colleague uh, who's had many, many more years in Australian diplomacy than myself, and much, much deeper and richer experience than I've had. Um, and I think Colin would agree that this is a perennial about the funding of the diplomatic service. There's a certain irony in this, though, from a China perspective. Um, it's only, well, it's a long time, I guess, in some ways, nine years since I left the embassy in Beijing. The resources probably have almost doubled in that time. But today, because of the state of relationship, they've got nothing to do. So, you know, you'd welcome and applaud the, the resources that are now in the embassy in Beijing and China, and we've opened a diplomatic mission in Chengdu, in addition to the others we have, and we've opened in Shenyang. Um, it's not there's money or not, it's, it, it's the political leadership, it's the drive from the politicians, from the ministers, really from a prime minister and supported by a very able foreign minister. I think Colin will recognise a lot of what I've said is harking back to the 80s and 90s, which were formative years for me as they were for Colin, and they were hell-sicken days for Australian diplomacy. We led regional diplomacy, we created APEC, we um, Gareth Evans did the Cambodia peace settlement. Uh, even more recently, in the early 2000s, we created the Bali process on people smuggling, regional diplomacy, coalition building, international coalition building, Bob Hawke's uh, Antarctic Wilderness Park, um, um, UN 
UN uh, embargoes on small arms, on landmines. Australia has been in the forefront of all of those efforts, some of them originally Australian ideas, driven and led by Australia, because we had prime ministers and foreign ministers who believed in the issues, understood that was how Australia's interests were really advanced, and pushed it, and provided the resources for it. So I think really that, you know, I, I live in hope that that day will come again. Um, I think the world misses Australia's activist, busybody diplomacy um, because it filled a niche. And I have to say, when I first went to China as ambassador in 2007, the Chinese used to say, what's happened to Australia? Where are you? You used to be so active in the region. You did things that we could not do because when you pr promote, pr pr uh, promoted ideas, um, there are ideas we, we supported, but if we had have done it, everyone would have blocked us, meaning the US would have blocked us. Um, but th those years have long gone, and, and China has gone on and created the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. I spoke a little bit about Belt and Road, the organization, the Shanghai Organization for Cooperation, the BRICS Bank. It goes on. China has actually been very busy in international coalition building and institution building, and I think much of the discussion about China and Australia misses that, and I think that, again, underscores that the real competitive space for us is not going to be through weaponized foreign policy, uh, but through diplomacy. Hello, good afternoon. I'm from the Chinese community. And when we talk about the relation between China and Australia, but that we always focus on the relation with Chinese uh, government, the communist government. And I want to ask the question, as everybody know, in China, the communist government is not elected by the people, it's one party dictatorship. Do you think the Chinese communist government can represent uh, all the people of China and keep the interest of all the people of China? And the second question, the Chinese communist uh, government, they abuse the human rights in China, persecute the political dissidents and the religion practitioners in China. And do you think Australia have a good relation with the Chinese communist government? The Chinese communist government can do the good thing to Australia? Okay, thank you. And the other, the third question, how do you think about the Senate, uh, the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrew, signed the agreement for the one bell, one row uh, with the communist regime in, in Beijing last week. How do you, how, what's your opinion about that? Thank you. Thanks, they're all, they're all good points and they're, they're issues that the, uh, uh, the Minister for Home Affairs, uh, the Minister for Stop the Boats uh, was referring to last week. The reality is this is not about um, remaking China in someone else's interest, it's about what's in Australia's interest. We can only approach the relationship on the basis of what's in Australia's interest and we have to work with what we've got. China has a one-party authoritarian communist state. That's no secret. Um, and it's getting more authoritarian under President Xi. But that's what we've got to work with. Um, we signed a free trade agreement with the same people. We've tried to sign countless agreements. So the fact that the Andrews government has signed one more is neither here nor there, except for in my speech, if you'd been listening closely, you would have heard that I said it was a good thing, a very good thing. Um, but it's because it's in our interests. And if you were worried, as some uh, who oppose us signing, uh, are worried because if we were to sign on Good Australia, we would give the Belt and Road Initiative some sort of higher level of moral authority or support, forget it. I said there's 152 countries have already signed on, 18 European countries with whom we'd be like-minded in terms of human rights and values, um, and any number of UN organisations. So it's already legitimised, it's already a fact. But I, I just say that you, ra you raise very valuable points, but they all, but these issues need to be looked at from what's in Australia's interest. Because that's our job as diplomats, and it's the government's job, is to defend and protect Australia's interest. My contention is having weaponized foreign policy and the way they're approaching it, including the way uh, the media is whipping this up, it's, it's inimical, it's against Australia's interest. <coughs> <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, 
the people who are driving this animosity towards China is, is the Murdoch media. I mean, there are other people, of course, as well. Uh, and Australian foreign policy seems to be, well, it, it, it tended to, in the past, hang on to the apron strings of Britain, and now it's hanging on to the apron strings of the United States. And there's a huge contradiction here because Australia is so incredibly dependent economically on China. Now, I'm, I'm just wondering what you think, because uh, in terms of what, where the Liberal Party is going, because the way they are going right now, it seems to me it could happen that uh, the Chinese government could cut economic relations drastically and Australia is in a huge crisis. Uh, that's true. Uh, we, are, we are very exposed. 36% of our exports now go to China. Um, John can give you the numbers on students. There's, you know, 1.2 million Chinese tourists. You know, um, uh, we are extremely exposed. But that's as it is. Because it's not because we want to be exposed to China or will it. It is just there are profound complementarities between Australia and China. And this is what Bob Hawke understood so clearly and presciently when he first really engaged in China after the 83 election that. We'd seen what happened with Japan. This is the old flying geese model of development. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong even. As they liberalized their economies, opened, engaged in trade, incomes rose, uh, then their demand for Australia's raw materials, agricultural products, and so on, increased massively. One thing that wasn't really predicted, though, was uh, how, how, how important China would become for Australian service exports, like education and, and tourism and many other service exports as well. So, um, so that is as it is. We, have, we are more dependent on China than anyone else. So that behoves an Australian government to, to, of any political persuasion to deal with China in a much more sophisticated way than what we currently see. And one thing I, I've always said in my speeches in, in terms of arguing for more resources, effort, focus, attention to China within Australia including cultural activities, is that China is more important to Australia economically than any other country. China stands further apart from any other major power in terms of, historically, in terms of um, political and social organisation, and further apart than any other major dominant power that, that we've experienced. <coughs> Therefore, managing China requires a much greater effort by Australia, and Australian politicians and bureaucrats and diplomats, uh, than um, any other set of relationships we have to manage. So on one hand it's so important, on the other hand it's so complex and difficult, and so ergo you should be putting vastly more effort and attention into it. That gentleman over there. Yep, the back. Uh, hello, I, I don't really have any credentials, I've just got a question. Um, so you mentioned before how ASIO has been involved in some of the business affairs within Australia um, regarding foreign interference and have been quite, I suppose you could call it, proactive in warning about those. It certainly seems like that is a very, um, it, gives them, it gives them a job to do, for lack of a better word. It certainly seems like it keeps them um, doing something without trying to run into any conspiracies here. To what degree do you think, if any, do you think that the actions of bodies like ASIO may be contributing to this, you know, China threat narrative? Uh, I have, um, personally, I have no doubt. Uh, and I base that on the fact that there have been stories in some of the um, media reporting, uh, particularly Four Corner reports, where the assumption would have to be that the only source for the backgrounding of the journalists had come from Asia. You spoke a lot of, uh, about uh, Australia, Australia's interactions with the US in this whole issue. I don't recall you mentioning the Quadrilateral Security Group. I wonder, has that fallen away? Could Australia's interests be advanced by a more uh, 
united approach through the quadrilateral security group, thus uh, bringing in some more, um, some more Asian perspectives into this whole complex picture. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, look, I'm, I'm on the record of being, as being very critical of the quadrilateral um, security group, or whatever it's called, these are quadrilateral dialogue of democracies, I think, um, and for various reasons. But in short, it's uh, a contained China body. Its, it's, it's raison d'etre is to contain China. However, it's packaged and tried to be fudged. Um, and it came, it came from Prime Minister Abe back in 2007 when he was first elected for that brief stint in his book before he got elected. He proposed it. Um, and it's waxed and waned, as you say. It's, it's actually in a waxing phase at present. There was a meeting of quadrilateral foreign ministers recently on the margins of the UN General Assembly. Um, but look, here's, here's the problem I have with it. I, I, I'm all for coalitions, as I've said, um, and some coalitions to lean against China, but I prefer them to be based around ASEAN uh, for the following reason. The three, three members of the quadrilateral are China's strategic competitors. The US, we know, ascend, you know the dominant power versus the ascendant power. Uh, Japan, and that's where Abe was coming from, was strategic competition and threat from China. Uh, and India, which has a live, hostile border dispute with India and is a strategic competitor um, so well, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. So it, it, it beggars belief for me, and no one's ever been able to explain it, why it's in Australia's interest for us to join uh, a group of four countries where three are China, Australia's strategic competitors and we say China is not a strategic competitor. So there's a sleight of hand going on, right? The reality is it's um, Tokyo, Washington, stitching up Canberra as part of a attempt to contain China. And India is very ambivalent, by the way. And you wouldn't want to be in any team where, that India's on because you don't, you know, they pursue their interests as they should, but they do it in a way that we don't. Uh, the other thing is it's, it's quadrilateral grouping of democracies. We'll bring in South Korea. Why wasn't South Korea ever involved? That's because it's perceived to be weak on containment of China. And you can say the same for Singapore. Philippines is a rip-roaring democracy in the region. We may not like their human rights. Bring them in. And that would be a serious coalition if you're proposing that. Make it a real coalition of democracies, but have all the Asian democracies present, um, not just China's strategic competitors, plus us as the odd man in. Thank you for such a stimulating talk, Dr. Raby. May I ask, is it in Australia's interests and does it promote what Australia stands for to have collaboration between Chinese and Australian universities and students that leads to the situation that we have in Xinjiang today with a million Uyghurs imprisoned is it in Australia's interests and what we believe in to have the Chinese language media in Australia virtually owned by Chinese authorities and therefore giving the limited Chinese line? And finally, is it in Australia's interests to have so many students from China in Australia who battle other Chinese students in Australia so that the ones who have never, for example, heard of Tiananmen Massacre tell those who promote the interests of the Hong Kong demonstrators, tell them that they're unpatriotic. Are these three examples really in Australia's interests and what Australia stands for? No, good. Look, on the first one, um, I think you're referring to that um, uh, statement made on the Four Corners about uh, cooperating on genetic um, research. As I said, I mean, I doubt that any cooperation in Australia on genetic research would, well, one, in the time frame, be available, but two, uh, would be necessary for China to work out who are Uyghurs and who are not. Uh, that doesn't detract from... Um, genuine concerns over what's happening in Xinjiang. 
Uh, but it's simply to say we need proportionality, and that's the whole point of my presentation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are issues on campuses, um, how serious they are, the extent to which they happen, the extent to which they're orchestrated by the consulates. That's really a subject for university administrations to deal with. Uh, I don't think it's in Australia's interest not to have students from China, if that's the consequence. So, again, to those points that you raise, I think you know, each one is valid in and of itself. How we respond is the question. And that's why the paper is very much calling and urging context and proportionality. And there'll be some things that clearly won't be in Australia's interest, or some things against our values that we would not want to be involved with, with China. Um, but I think we have a pretty robust record of making sure China understands what our values are. But what I would say is that it doesn't help us for there not to be high-level political engagement because the best way in a highly hierarchical system like China to have any impact on behavior in China is for those messages to go across at the most senior levels. Uh, and today that doesn't happen. Um, thank, you. thank you, Jeff, and thank you for a great oration. Uh, I'm just wondering if you, if you sort of stood back and listened to your speech, you, you might well form the view that the China-Australia relationship is not recoverable. And is that, is that your view? And if it's not your view, is it simply the stronger focus on diplomacy and some of those other common good initiatives that you mentioned, or are there um, larger single strategic policy initiatives which could um, break um, down the barriers to communication at the moment? Thanks, John. Look, in the current political environment in Australia, um, uh, the prospect of any near-term change and improvement in the relationship, I think, looks pretty bleak. Um, on the other hand, I don't think I'd be standing here for 45 minutes giving a speech like this if I thought it was irredeemable. Um, but it was very disappointing before the last election. I mean, your, old, your own team did not want to say anything about the relationship. And I think uh, it was very, very unfortunate that uh, uh, you know, your spokesperson on foreign policy was almost silent on China and trying to take the lowest possible uh, profile. I think we have to have a robust debate and it has to be led by uh, politicians. And that's why I'm trying to provide arguments about context and proportionality in order to frame a debate that can be had without uh, people being easily uh, attacked for uh, um, going over to the dark side and becoming panda huggers like me. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be difficult, but I think the, the reality is going to impose itself on us at some point in time. Um, and uh, when that is, I don't know. But you know, there's been periods when we haven't had an independent foreign policy to speak of, and then we've had politicians of the stature of Whitlam who have, over, the, over years, made the case and built momentum and support, and the reality shifted in his direction, and policy could be changed, and settings could be changed. And I think we're probably in an analogous period as that. So um, I'm not very hopeful, but I'm not entirely uh, bleak that it won't change by the ability to argue the case domestically, but also by the changing external reality. <coughs> Oh, thank you. My question is, um, do you think uh, the China uh, relations uh, issue is becoming a partisan issue in the Australian politics? Um, and if so, is that a Euro thing for a foreign, for, for, for foreign affairs issue to become a partisan issue in the Australian politics? Well, foreign affairs in Australian politics is a... Um, it's a funny thing. There are no votes in foreign policy, uh, but there's enormous sensitivity by politicians around foreign policy settings. Um, it was put to me the other day by one of Australia's most senior political commentators in the media, no prizes for who I was chatting with, um, uh, that 
China policy will be used by the populist conservatives uh, to attack Morrison. That Morrison, of course, is not their man. Uh, Dutton is their man, and they won't settle uh, for Morrison. So it was put to me by this commentator that if you look, drought has become the attack weapon on Morrison by the, 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 the conservative populist commentators. And that China is always there, ever present, to be used against Morrison as well. So uh, it is a very difficult and, and ultra uh, hi uh, hypersensitive issue within the tiny world of um, you know, political leadership issues and so on within the parties, but doesn't, I think, garner many votes outside of Canberra, except that uh, it feeds a narrative of a sort of Pauline Hanson type of approach or a populist approach. And instead of feeds that narrative, it has particularly conservative politicians very nervous about these issues. <coughs> so um, one time for one more question from this half of the room. Lady at the front there, please. Um, thank you for an incredibly illuminating um, speech on China. What interests me from what you've been saying is how is it playing out on the day-to-day -day level, on the practical level of intercultural exchanges and business exchanges on the ground? Well, I think it's already having an impact, and and you know, as I said, the latest trade bilateral trade numbers came out, and China's our exports to China have grown mainly because of high iron ore prices, which are totally unexpected. And iron ore prices are currently about ninety dollars a ton. Um, a year ago, probably the equilibrium price would have been something in the mid fifties, uh, but there were those terrible tailings dam collapses in Brazil, and that has substantially been a supply shock. And hence, you know, uh, Andrew Forrest was able to receive a $1.2 billion uh, uh, dividend, which is uh, good money. So, no, but, but I think that's an external factor that I think is showing up in the aggregate figures. If you took that out, and it's hard to do the counterfactual, um, of course, what would trade be, or student numbers be, or investment be, if relations were in the best of health? We don't know, but it's worth contemplating that. Um, but it's quite clear from what I hear that not only are officials um, not able to have contact with their counterparts, they can't get appointments for Australian companies that want to have meetings with, with Chinese officials. Uh, I think that's particularly at the Beijing level, and specific examples deal with uh, uh, AQSIQ, the quarantine body, but others. And some businesses have come to me and, and want a second opinion or see if I can help or whatever, which I can't. So I'm not drumming up business. But uh, that's you know, so how I pick this up. They say, Look, is, is this real? We're told by the embassy we can't get a, a meeting. And, you know, and so I think it is real. I mean, John would probably know more from the ACBC angle. So that all must have a very dampening effect on the commercial relationship. Thank you.